Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. Uh, I have as a guest today, Ogird Ujimbo. Uh, I am, of course, uh, Will Richardson, your host here in Warsaw, in the capital city. But you're in the capital city too, Ogird. Yeah, that's an exception because... Uh, Very sneaky. A, yeah, sneaky move. Yeah, but I have a lecture tomorrow in a festival, as a part of a festival of science. Our Oriental Studies Department is doing a whole day of lectures on uh, cultures of Oriental origins, although Warsaw Oriental cultures would also include other parts of the world, not only, not only Oriental. Anyway, I'm, I'm talking about Chinese writing system. So wow. if anybody understands Polish, feel invited for Sunday, su Where? Sunday Where exactly? 4 o'clock at Warsaw University building at Nowy Świat 69. Nowy Świat 69. So right yeah. on the main street there. And uh, uh, it's not hard to find. And what's the time again? Uh, we start at 10 o'clock in the morning, but it will be difficult to get there. And my lecture is the last one in the set at four o'clock in the afternoon. Ah, maybe I'll maybe I'll be able to make it over. Sure. See you, see you in action. Just beware, it's going to be in Polish. I I, I understand that. Yeah, um, you know, I speak a bit. There's going to be a lot of Chinese there too, so no worries. Mm -hmm. you and you're going to be over there at the uh, University of Knowledge, is that right? The University of Warsaw, and yeah. it's a uh, Festival of Science. Festival of Science. Festival Nauki. That sounds great. Festival Nauki. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Nauki is the Polish word for science. Very good. No właśnie. No właśnie. <laughs> no, the producer told me to say that. I don't know why he told me to say that. I, th I don't even know what it means. Does it mean I have to do the washing or something? <laughs> yeah. No właśnie is a kind of a filler word that say exactly that. It means like, yeah, rzeczywiście uh, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. Right, very good. I'm glad we got my, my Polish lesson over. And for those of you folks out there, when somebody some, says something you agree with, you can say, no, właśnie, which is one of the easiest no. phrases in Polish, along with cześć. We should we, we should do some easy Polish phrases one of these yeah, times. You know, you should concentrate on the word no in Polish, which is very confusing for foreigners. Yeah, because, because it doesn't mean no. It means yes. It means, very often it may mean yes. Sometimes it may be a warning or sometimes it may be no. It can just be like after English. Yeah, no, it yeah. can be negative. Yeah. Watch for the nodding or the shaking when they say no. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, no, właśnie means yes, of course, or no. yes, exactly, right? Yes, exactly. No, no, yeah. no Exactly what I was talking about is no, właśnie. Gosh, the the language is. Hard. I, I somebody posted that uh, a thing somewhere on the social media there, maybe it was Facebook. I'm not sure, but uh, they posted a thing that said uh, the hardest language for English speakers to learn. What are the hardest t top three for English speakers to learn? Not for Poles, not for Slavic speakers. It's a little different. It's different. You're coming from a, from a totally different background when you know the Slavic languages. But uh, for an English speaking dummy like me, uh, what, is, what are the top three hard languages? What do you think, being a linguist? Being a linguist, I don't really believe in this kind of... Uh, in this kind of... Uh, lists because it's it's very hard to say it's very individual and i yeah it is individual some, yeah there, there are some things that may be more or less hard for somebody but even with an english speaking word you've got european englishes like maltese english or uk english that have more exposure to european languages for whom those languages will not be difficult or you've got hong kong english that will have no problem with learning chinese but I would bet that American, American English speaking natives would have problems with basically any language. Yeah, including their own. But uh, as we <laughs> I see. I not want to say that. I, as I we see from our that. president, who, who is worse than or more advanced than uh, 
What's the fellow who, who invented Esperanto? Uh, Joe Biden's more advanced Zamenhof. than... What? Zamenhof, yeah. He's yeah. more... Uh, Joe Biden's more advanced than Zamenhof in inventing new words. Well, I, I enjoy that. You know, the, the, the aphasia is a very interesting phenomenon studied by linguists, so it's very interesting. It is a kind of aphasia, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, is, of... Isn't that the same thing Bruce Willis had at the start? They said, yeah. I, yeah, a lot of people have it, unfortunately, and it's uh, it, is, it is very popular now because of the all chemistry we have in water and in plants. We might have it at the end. Even those, th th this is very sad. My father spoke a couple of languages and he still has it. It's very sad. And theoretically, linguists will tell you that if you know a lot of languages, you will not have any kind of Alzheimer's or very mild, but it's... Isn't that, again, it is very individual. If you know languages, you shouldn't get it at Alzheimer's because your brain is always working, right? Yeah. Well, it, it, it doesn't work this way. My father is an example, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. You, can't, you cannot uh, make it's, it's, hard it's, and it's, fast rules. It's the same thing with, the, with the languages and its difficulty. For, for example, for some people, that would be Chinese. For other people, that may be Polish or any other Slavic language. You can uh, judge it by, for example, looking into how long is a course uh, devoted to a given language, in, for example, for American diplomats. And yeah. I guess Polish doesn't make it as a very difficult language. It doesn't? No, no, it doesn't. But by some other ways of calculating the difficulty, Polish makes it as one of the most difficult languages, which I don't really believe in. Well, yeah, it's hard. It's hard because for you, Pol I'm sorry, I stepped on you. Go ahead. I lost. This is okay. I, I personally find Mongolian extremely difficult. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so do I. But <laughs> I really do. That Mongolian, that's tough for me. And uh, yeah, but the, the food, not bad. Yeah. I, I might tell yeah. you something because we were trying when I was studying in China. We were trying to. What's the, what this gang called in English, because in Polish it's głuchy telefon, the dumb phone. Uh, it's when you s have a row of people and oh, one... Oh, oh, oh. We call it chi Chinese whispers. Into... Yeah, Chinese whispers. Oh, ironically enough, we're playing Chinese whispers in Sorry. China. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, you know what... Which, which we always I... thought they were sneaky. No, never mind, never mind. <laughs> anyway... Uh, when we were playing it, the, the, the languages that were most tangled after we played in the, the, the natives of at least seven different languages yeah. was Mongolian and Polish. What was the first one? Mongolian. was the ah, most Mongolian. complicated one to yeah. relay. And the second one was Polish. People always get mm. confused. Yeah. The, what, they said in the, what they said in this article there was the, the number one most difficult was Chinese, and the number two most difficult was Arabic, and then came Polish, which I'd well, heard before. I'd heard that said before, more or less like that. But of course, there are other derivations of those languages are closely related. Georgian would probably be hard, especially to write. Um, and you, no, Georgian right. is very easy to write. Is it? It's just, yeah, because this is a normal proper alphabet, which is pretty well mapping what is written to what is spoken. The difficulty in Georgian starts to come in with the grammar and with the pronunciation. They have this very okay. strange vowels, like not vowels, but consonants like th, k, which are different from any other European language. That's why it's getting tricky. But the writing, I, I, I accept that, of course. You know what you're talking about. But the... Uh... Uh, the writing looks very difficult. No, no, it's it's it's, it's a simple. Old, maybe I'm looking talking about the old school Georgian. Do they have a new? No, 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 no. I'm talking about the old school Georgian. There is a very nice exercise made okay. by Russians, but it is uh, possible to make it in any other language. When you have a given language, and you replace in this language letters, yeah, responding to particular sounds from Georgian. And you replace it one letter by another. Every next text is just the same text, without only one sound replaced. 
and after uh, having like 20 or 30 texts read, you basically start recognizing Georgian. It's very simple. You know what we should do? I mean, we're going to talk about a few other things today. We've got quite a list, but... <laughs> <laughs> but no, this is, I'd love to do. You just, could be started on languages. Come I on. would like to do a program with you about language. I think that'd be fascinating. Yeah, sure. For, I'd love to do it. I think people yeah. would find it interesting. And to know where Polish is in this group of languages, Slavic languages, and, and how that relates to Oriental and Western languages, I think that'd be great. Let's do that sometime. Will you do it? Oh, of course. That's, that's what Super. I. Super. That'd be great. Then we can really take advantage, not just of your. Uh, your uh, uh, intelligence, but also your knowledge, specific knowledge on this subject. Be great. And I'll try and make your lecture tomorrow. Okay, now, uh, I went, you recommended, I, I went on a long trip. I worked for four days filming uh, this week. I went, but it started in a place that we talked about, uh, which is in a place as odd as Brudno, which means dirty in English. On, more no, or less. No, 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 what no, does no, it mean? No. What does it mean? That's Brudno. Brudno. No, no, no. no, these are homophones. Brudno is dirty with the with the yeah, normal with U. With a U, yeah. Here it is written with O because it comes from another word, brud, which doesn't mean dirt, but means the place to cross the river by foot. You fell Shall right. You fell right into my evil linguistic trap there, and I got a great explanation. Thank you, sir. That's perfect. <laughs> so this explains why this was a great place for the first permanent settlement in Warsaw, which we talked briefly about, and I went there. It's a hole in the ground, more or <laughs> less. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. I know that they do some. some they act out uh, the old days sometimes there. They have festivals there. Uh, but it is still fascinating, nonetheless, because the burn, uh, it's, more, it's like a, a burn, uh, this raised earthen mound, quite high, actually, a few meters high, um, uh, is still there. And, uh, and you can see the sort of uh, circle that it made. And uh, uh, it's very interesting, strategically placed. Uh, because it's it's surrounded by swamp on, you know, about 75 percent, 70 percent, 75 percent of it, and uh, uh, it's a beautiful forest. I, I think this is the biggest uh, park of its kind uh, close to Warsaw. Uh, maybe maybe the Bielany is is a bit bigger, but um, it's certainly up there. Very beautiful park, actually. Yeah, it's, it's a nice place, and it was uh, a strategic point, strategic vantage point. To, Why was uh, it so strategic? Well, it was placed along the river. A river was a communication hub of, of, of that time. And if you look at the history of Europe, the big rivers were the communication, uh, communication devices for Vikings. And there was a lot of fighting between Slavs and Vikings, and that was supposedly one of the outposts here in the Slavic land. Yeah, the Viking outpost, right? Yeah. Yep. Which is really, really interesting. And, uh, but it's not on the Vistula. It's not on the Vistula, yeah. as Poles would say. It is on a smaller river, the Brud River, yep. right? Which ran to downhill to the Vistula, obviously. Yeah. But you don't want to be right on the Viswa because that's too, I, I suppose, too, um, you'd be too exposed. So, like the early American colonists who went to Jamestown, they found an island, the British col colonists, they found an island uh, with a small causeway, and that's where, which was easily defended, and that's where they put their first outpost, uh, surrounded by water, so, and marsh, rather yeah. like this place. So... That was interesting as well. But it's a nice little park. And they have a beautiful uh, sort of bridge over the swamp in the not far away. You can find it. It's uh, on the map. And if you go a walk through that, th on a walk through that forest, uh, you'll, see, you'll see the bridge. We, we shot, we filmed all this and filmed something on the, on the, on the, in the fortress uh, and on the top and in it, and, and then on that bridge uh, talking about all this history that I, that I then it's, it's I read about. Yeah. 
there is actually a lot of uh, a lot of these kind of old structures in northern Poland, which are not really well known. The the, the old uh, uh, only have hedges now, right? Yeah. But the old structures that used to be kind of defensive structures in 10th or 11th century or 12th century, and before that, historians were not actually expecting anything of a kind in that in that number. But once the the great roads towards the north of the uh, Baltic Sea were constructed. They were also doing archaeological research. And there is a lot of new finds there. It was a really interesting. But is this and more of the of same seven, time? We're talking yeah. 1,100 yeah. years ago sort of thing? Yes, yes. 1,150 years ago, this area? No, no, no. I'm talking about modern time the discoveries. The discoveries are in the modern times because of the new, new Via Baltica. The, the discoveries, yes, but the settlements or these, these archaeological the finds. A thousand years old. From a thousand, yeah. yeah. People don't realize. People think, oh gosh, we just started getting things organized recently, but you know, we talked about. Uh, I mean, they were, people back then had to be very clever about. Life was very difficult, and they had to be very clever about how they set things up. Uh, for their survival, as precious as life was to them, uh, because of its shortness and uh, uh, the difficulty of staying alive and difficult circumstances. So they had to be really organized. And uh, th there's even that, if you go to Conan, there's this marker that the, uh, 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 that the Romans put there. It's in Latin. The Romans put it there so they could make their way up to the Gdansk area uh, and uh, Kaliningrad, what we call Kaliningrad now, area to get the to get the amber and Lithuania and those all along there. So this ancient stuff, it's very interesting that they're finding more and more of this because there was a lot going on here, even before the establishment of the Polish kingdom. Yeah. Yes, you should you should take a look into, for example, uh, you're talking talking about the Arabic language. There is Ibn Yaqub, I believe. It, I, Ibrahim ibn Yaqub, I, I don't uh, exactly remember the name, the Arabic traveler in, again, thousand years ago, that described pretty well the, the entire Slavic lands, Poland and Ukraine included. And he writes about the wealthy countries with a lot of people, not what we imagine from the history books. Yeah. Because, What's yeah. his name again? I, 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 remember, I came across him in my reading. Ibn Yaqub, I believe. Yeah. I have to check it, but Ibn Yaqub. Ibn, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 what, yeah, I seem to remember. And this, those are very interesting things. If somebody is interested in the history, you should actually take a look at the recent finds, which are proving how well settled the area was a thousand years ago. Read Jakub, and uh, yeah, because the Germans that were fighting with the Slavic. Uh, Slavic tribes here, they were not interested in presenting them as a, and in, in any way developed. Same Vikings, but Arabic guy was just simply traveling and he presents as a bit different picture. One of the Vikings were running about in boats and things, and these people had established towns, villages, they were farming. I mean, this is the higher form of civilization, obviously, than Don't marauding. Don't disregard the Vikings because the Vikings also had a hand in, in organizing quite a lot of things with the Slavs and against the Slavs, but also for the Slavs. Yeah. So this is a very interesting hate-love relationship there. Yeah, mixed bag. I would, I would, for example, say that most of my countryside friends from Z Zambrov are kind of Viking descendants. They were settled by partially Viking people that were in service of Mazovian princes. Well, you see a great mix of the sort of Scandinavian look, the Slavic look, and and Oriental looks throughout throughout Poland. You, if you study the faces, it's fascinating, actually. Uh, yeah, the, the I, kind I, I of really patterns prefer, of. Yeah. I really prefer looking in, at Poland as more like Jagiellonian understanding of the of of my country than what we have in the super nationalistic outlook. What would that it's, be? What would that be? The Jagiellonian well, outlook. Jagiellonian output would be would be the outlook would be seeing Poland as a federation of different actors of very different religions, of very different nationalities, all of them more or less feeling free in the land of free people, working for the best of the kingdom. And this would, I Federation. suppose... Would it's, very, it's like, like, like 
United States of Europe in a way, because that would have been a federation in the understanding, on the good understanding of the world, and uh, up to the to the situation where different nationalities could have had in old Poland a separate civil systems, separate law. Yeah, this uh, th this is very interesting. Yeah, this uh, this idea it falls right in with the Casimir the Great sort of. If you look at him as a model of, of uh, medieval Poland and, and what he was doing, I think that fits very well with what you're saying, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's my, my the beginning of the Jagiellonian process. Yeah. And then we go on, and then unfortunately, of course, historically we collapsed, which is very sad because that idea is very, yeah. for me, much more appealing than 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 other ones. Although we can connect, we can connect also with nationalistic ones when we see that nation right now Poland is pretty more much more um, homogenic nation than before yeah I mean if you look at uh, for example what Pasutsky stood for he was for this Kazimierz the Great type of uh, mixture of people, and he and you know that was very practical because that's the makeup of Poland at the time, which was, uh, you know, from the 1900 until you know uh, uh, the, the Second World War, but also, um, but also, uh, he was very much about centrist politics, and and, and also a nationalist in the sense of more in the American sense. We're all Poles together, whatever group we come from. We speak this language officially, which is Polish. And or uh, they, even, they even went so far as to invent Esperanto, as we spoke about earlier, to try and include everyone in the world in this idea. So it's fascinating, uh, fascinating well, subject. These ideas are, are pretty, yeah, pretty relevant, especially now when we have yep. all this situation with Baltic states and Ukraine, and uh, yeah, I hope the whole quarrel between Polish farmers and Ukrainian farmers will not develop in any bigger conflict, because that would be really sad. And yeah, it's well. It this must... this the problem with that is you can't. Uh, the way I see it is, Poland took in so many people has not given been given credit for that because they weren't the right color to a lot of people. I mean, it's putting it simplistically, but that is the woke uh, agenda is often very simplistic. Um, and instead of being given credit for all Poland has done, as soon as there's a chink, I mean, you can only give so much. You can't bankrupt your farmers, right? And grain needs to be, uh, is like gold now, and it needs to be protected for the world. It's not just a Polish thing or a Ukrainian thing, that grain should be treated as something that belongs to the world to stop people from starving. And uh, no, frankly speaking, I understand the, the work on grain because I've been, I live in the countryside. Yeah. I've been talking to people and they're really upset about yeah. part, of, part of the actions that we are taking because they are not benefiting our villagers and they are really scrapping by because they are heavy tax, they have problems because of the heating, because of the yeah. fuel, because well, inflation. of inflation. Yeah. So they cannot bear yeah. those costs and right. on top of that other things. So yeah. they understand the actions and unfortunately, which is again, it all turns into something that is really worrying for me into partisan problem. It should not be. Yes. I couldn't agree more. I think it's exactly right. And the problem of grain and the shipments of grain uh, is that this should be by agreement amongst all the major countries in Europe or all the countries in Europe. Everybody should take a share in this and help to uh, make sure that that market stays stable. And it's not lumped on one country. That is more important than immigration because this is sustenance of life. This is, uh, in a time of war, uh, perhaps the most important thing uh, is, is making sure that people don't starve because of the war. Anyway, we've got to end the section now.
uh, and uh, we're not going to solve that problem. But I think it's a problem that needs to be looked at very carefully and with some sympathy uh, for all sides and, f and, a, and a huge amount of fairness, uh, because this is in everyone's interest. Uh, uh, but we don't want to bankrupt the very people who are helping the people in trouble, okay? This is, this is the important thing that has to be understood. Okay, we'll be right back after this break with more with Ogird Ujimbo, a fantastic linguist. Did you hear what he said? Mm. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. We're talking with uh, uh, Professor Ogird Ujimbo. He doesn't like it when I call him Professor, but I, I prefer to call him Professor. If is that okay? It's still not okay, you know. I, I don't want no. to be along no. with the other stars of Polish TV, like Janoszek or, <laughs> or Wireful, the, the wonderful band that did not make career in China. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, we're back. That was a, a riveting first 25 <laughs> minutes. Uh, I, I wanted to tell you about some of the places I went, though, uh, in... Uh, last week in my four days of travels. I started off, as we said, uh, with Brudno and the Viking place that you know about, right? You told me about. And then I went on to, uh, we went on to Yabwana. Do you know the palace over there, Yabwana? Yeah, yes. It's, uh, well, it's along the river, really along the river. You can walk right from the palace to the edge of the river pretty, pretty quick. Uh, and there's a val this sort of uh, dike right behind the palace to protect from floods. I mean, it runs all along from through Warsaw, below Warsaw, all the way to, gosh, I guess the whole length of the river on both sides. And uh, that's, that's kind of interesting, the no man's land of where the dike is uh, and the sort of uh, uh, the riverside life and everything. But... Uh, at any rate, this palace was built in the 18th century, and it looks like it, too. It's got the real simple, elegant style of the 18th century, um, which is a kind of architecture that really appeals to me. I don't know how you feel about it or think about it. But uh, did you know, here's the interesting thing about Yabwana Yab Palace, besides uh, uh, that it's, it's beautiful and the grounds are beautiful and the location is beautiful, is that uh, the Russian government in exile was based there. Did you know that? Yeah. You knew that? Yeah. From November last year. Can, do you know something about that, what they were doing? No, I was known that they, they, they do not, well, I don't think they have any power at all. <laughs> no, they have no power. I think it's just a meeting place for dissidents, journalists, they uh, set up a meeting place for, for journalists and some of them. But the most important meeting place for Russians in, is not Yabwana, it's still Berlin. It's still Berlin, right? Yes. If you look into, into, into Russian media, it's mostly, mostly Berlin. And those are the, 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 the meetings they mentioned. And they very rarely talk about Poland. Poland is barely existing, existing in Russian media other than the, you know, the aim for the nuclear bombs. Yeah, well, they don't want to give any, uh, the Russians never want to give any credence to Poland yep. because the Russians think Poland is still theirs. <laughs> you know the old saying, right? Kurica nie ptica, Polska nie zagranica. Do you know that saying in Russian? No. A hen is not a bird and Poland is not a foreign country. A, he a what? A hen. A is hand, not, a hand is, is not a bed. Yes. A hen, like, you know, the egg-lying hen. A hen is not a bed, okay. And, uh, and Poland is not a foreign country. Okay. Well, that... Boy, that's a... Those Russians are pretty good with a phrase, aren't they? I have no idea what it means. Nice. I have... is, uh, you know, the, 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 a hen or any chicken is not actually a flying bird, right? So Poland may pretend to be a bird, but it's not really a foreign country. Yeah. At least that is a saying that is, yeah. Okay, a hen is not a, I see, a hen is not a, it's not a, because it can't fly, it's not, it's not a yeah. bird. Okay, that's not so bad then. Who, who came up with that? 
No, I, I don't remember who is it, but it's a uh, pretty omnipresent in, yeah. in Russian discourse. A but hen is not a bird, foreign. and Poland is not a country. Those Russians, it's a they're... a foreign country, not a foreign country. Not a foreign country, because it's part of Russia. Yeah. That, hence, there's no need to talk about this annoying province called Poland. We talk about a real country, Germany. Okay. Yep. That's the idea, right. Anyway, the palace is really cool. There was a wedding going on. Some French people had gathered, uh, and with, there were Polish... Uh, family and a French family intermarrying. Very European. It was a beautiful day. And, so did you uh, go along the river further? Uh, yes. Uh, along the river? Well, it didn't go on the path. That's for another... I'm, I'm going to do a series on the on the Vistula River. Like we just finished a series on the Odre. But then you've got the Płock, right? Yeah. I mean, well, you've got to start... I've been to... We've been to Płock before on the show. And... I've, I've been to Plaza of course, but we filmed there. And uh, a very long pier there. This sort of modern pier they built out into the river. It's kind of interesting, actually, what they did there. Yeah. Plaza has a, it's, it's a very good setting. There's a lot you could do with it, but it still has a lot of remnants of communism. It does, hasn't had a great influx of uh, cash to remake the, the old town and things like that. But uh, in time, it's going to be a nice little spot. Certainly the countryside there is, is pretty. Yeah, but, because it, the, yeah. the whole run of Vistula River is actually very interesting. Yeah. Because it also ran through through like three three po parts of Poland after partition virtually. Yes, you that's right. Starting down in the Austrian part, going through the Russian part, ending up in the, in the Prussian part and yeah. German eventually. And also uh, what is really interesting is again, you've got You've got the most Czech connected part of Poland, and which is again a very European connection. And then you've got Gdańsk with its Hansa, which is another interesting story. The Hanseatic League. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to get there. We're going to get to Gdańsk, and we can opine on Gdańsk in a second. A couple of curious stories about that. Fascinating. Uh, there's so much to do in the Tri Cities, but we'll get there in a second. But you, uh, or in a couple of minutes. But you said, did we go further along the river? Yes, we did. We went to a very a place that not a lot of people go, which right. is this strange, uninhabited or sparsely inhabited land, very agricultural, just north of the Campinos and south of the Viswa as it turns. It makes its turn above Warsaw and goes west before it goes north again eventually. Um, and in this area, north of Campinos and south of the river, is very beautiful. It's very quiet there. It'd be a great place to live, I think. I've always liked it there. And uh, we, we went and, and filmed walking along the dike, where you could see the river and a few people fishing and stuff like that. It's a great place for bicycling. There's hardly any traffic, even on the main road. It's just not on in, in anyone's way. Uh, and lots of farming right up to the edge of the forest there. Uh, so beautiful area. That was fun. And then we went around. We just sort of circumnavigated uh, the, the, the forest and went down the western side to Brohov. Now, why, why is Brohov famous? Do you remember? You tell me. Yeah, there's a, there's a church there. All right. And this is the church. Uh, which, is, again, is uh, 17th, uh, 16th. It's, it's Renaissance started. And it, it's built uh, as a fortress church. It's like a mini castle. And the church is the sort of castle. And around it is this wall with the slits for firing through and all this sort of stuff. Uh, very interesting, unusual uh, piece of architecture. I must say I haven't been there, so it's... Yeah, Fantastic. It's, it's very yeah, interesting. For a start, yeah, for a stop. And this is where Chopin's parents were married, and Chopin was christened, or baptized, rather, if you will. And so uh, and it, it's close to, uh, you know, the famous house, and I, it slipped my mind, the famous house where... Jalazova Vola. Yes, that's it, Jalazova Vola. Where, uh, where Chopin grew up, uh, at least part of his life. He also lived uh, in Warsaw for some time before moving to France. But uh, it's a really cool church, actually. 
Um, and uh, there, the other thing about this place is that it was, a, it was the scene of a successful Polish battle in World War II, and there won a lot of those. But there was a successful Polish repulsion, uh, repulse of the, of the uh, German forces by the river there. Uh, so, an interesting place to visit. I uh, think you should you should you should visit our Zambrov historical museum because there is this guy who is really interested in history of Zambrov, and there is also one of the least known battles of Second World War in which the more German died than in the Wiesna defense. Wow, that's yeah yeah the Wiesna was a big was the big battle north of you and the Bierbsch, on the Bierbsche and on the uh, Narev River, rivers. So if you have time, I can introduce you to the guy. I don't know about his English, but I yeah, think look, we'll look, when, him up. when we come heading out that way, because we need to go to Bialvesia, uh, and, and I'd like to do that before winter sets in, uh, yeah, we can stop off and do something. It'd be fun. Let's okay, have to plan it. Yeah. There were, there were uh, Zuber sightings in my area recently. But you're only, uh, wow, really? Yeah. I yeah. didn't know they were running around just free in the yeah. forest. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Uh, and, and surprising. Um, but you're only there on the weekends, is that correct? Mm, soon that will be the truth. Right now I'm mostly based there. And as you see on the weekend, I'm in Warsaw. So it's going to be the opposite in the academic year. Well, I'm going to be in Jeshov this weekend. Uh, this today is the first day of uh, autumn, actually officially, and I'm going to be or second day of autumn. This weekend is the first weekend in autumn, that's for sure, and uh, I'm going to be down in Jeshov at the World for Ukraine conference, Wednesday to Friday this week, leaving on Saturday, and that promises to be a lot of guests from Ukraine and America, and I'll also be appearing on a on a program, American program. Uh, uh, talking about uh, developments in, in you know, you should Ukraine. invite Tucker yeah. Carlson to that. Sorry, what? You should invite Tucker Carlson to that conference. Um, I don't think he's interested in really an inter the, interested in abroad have, at all. I think he's interested have, in talking have about you heard the news that were spread in Russian media recently. Tell me. That he's opening the channel for Russian TV. I think it is a hoax, but still news are really, yeah, really made them really happy, and they were repeating it all the time. Now the yeah, well, house, they're playing they're right into hoax. his hands. But yeah. you have to be really careful what you say with the Russians because they've been doing this disinformation for a very long time. They're very good at it, and it's always been one of their best weapons. That and spying much more effective than as than we see as we see than their armed forces are so they're they're really good at this stuff yeah i, I hadn't heard that it's not true of course but it's no it's not true yeah. i believe it is not true but it's ridiculous it's been, you know popularized by the by the z channels as they're called in russian he, z channel he's not pro russia he's not pro ukraine he's not pro anything outside the united states that's the thing about him yeah uh, yeah, although he's spreading a lot of Russian disinformation along the way, but that's... Uh, well, yeah, he's <laughs> he's a what we call a uh, passive asset. Okay, let's move on to uh, Gdansk. We, don't, we haven't got a lot of time. Do you know Dolny, do you know Dolny Gdansk? I've been there, but uh, I don't say I know it. I don't know Gdansk that much. I spent a couple of days there. That's it. In, in Gdansk? Yeah. In your life? Yeah. What? Yeah, it's a shame, I know. I've, I've been there dozens of times. You see, I've been just a couple of times, it's just a few days. I believe I've been longer to Szczecin than to Gdańsk. Although Gdańsk is definitely really interesting. I, I haven't been to Szczecin very often, but uh, I, I didn't find Szczecin f too fetching. Did you like Szczecin? <laughs> Szczecin is not too fetching. No. Not really. I didn't find it too fetching. I preferred Tri-Cities very much, much more. Um, you know, anyway, Donegadansk is the part on the other side of the canals. There are th sort of three major canals yeah, in yeah, the yeah. city. They're all on that side, right? Once you cross the first one, 
going away from the dual guitar, the long market. Uh, then there's the next one. And then there's a further mm -hmm. one. Uh, but that second one is where, well, it's all Dolny Gdansk on that side. But my God, the way this place is developed over, you know, 15, 20 years is incredible. It and is really well done. I know, I know. It is they're really making well. it so nice. Nice. And this, that's the Bohemian quarter, though, Dolny Gdansk. It's Bohemian. And the further uh, southeast you go, the more Bohemian it is, till you get to the Bastion Jubra. And the old bastions, which were these places, you know, along the uh, 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 along the city moat canal that was created. It's the Motuava River, the Motuava, yep. not the Viswa, the Motuava. A lot of people think it's the Viswa. It's not. Um, uh, and uh, this bastion uh, is being renovated and, and making a sort of nice hilltop park out of it. So you can get a good view back over the city. And then you can see all the development they're doing. Tourist boats coming down those canals, uh, beautiful uh, Hanseatic style uh, apartment buildings. Some of them built from new in that style. Some of them remodeled on old grain, uh, out of old granaries. Fascinating place and very hip, very hip. I stayed in a hotel which had been converted from an old hospital and uh, factory complex and was absolutely super, as they say. Uh, somebody says that. I don't know who says that. I've heard it before. And uh, I highly recommend uh, this area uh, as a surprise. Oliva. Oliva. That's a, you took the word right out of my mouth. <laughs> That's where Is we that went next. Here? I wanted Where's to it? see the cathedral and the monastery yeah. and the bishop's Oh, sorry, the Abbot's Palace. This is a big historical landmark. It's fantastic. The park Did there. Did you listen Amazing. to the concert? What? On the organs? Huh? Did you listen to any concert? Because they have remarkable organs in the, in the old cathedral. Yes, they were playing the organ right as we, and I said, oh gosh, walk up to the door and film at the door. We didn't want to go film because something was going on. So we got music, yeah. Just it's like amazing. that. It's yeah, amazing. and it was amazing sound. Uh, yep. and, and we got about a minute and a half of that uh, organ uh, striking up. They're very famous. They're very famous and they're supposed to be one of the best in, in the country. Yeah. No, they were happy to see it. There's a, the guy was uh, like the character. He goes, oh, you're from television. I said, yes. And he goes, welcome. I said, oh, Vita, Vita. I said, OK, great. Yeah. Um, and then they have uh, a small refectory where you can order Polish delights and sit in, on this day in the sunshine. So you can. What is Polish delights? Uh, you know, pierogi. <laughs> Jurek. <laughs> pierogi and Jurek. Those delicacies and pancakes. Yeah. Uh, so sort of Polish fast food. And uh, then. Talking about delights, I must mention something. Okay. Because it will escape my memory. You say today is the first day of autumn, but do you know what is in the week? Well, it's the first weekend. I don't think it's the first day. Yeah, I don't well, know. Well, okay, the first weekend. Yeah. Do you know what is the next weekend starting with, on Friday? No, tell me. Chinese Moon Festival, the Mid-Autumn Festival. Is that, is, that, is that when they go out and everybody has to moon everybody? No wonder they're getting these diseases. Ah, what? they're eating mooncakes. Those are Chinese delights. Ah, oh, oh, you, oh, it's, oh, you mean it has to do with the, the orb in the sky, the moon? No, not the moon that you carry around with yourself. That, that, that hidden moon that everyone has. <laughs> Hopefully hidden in most cases. <laughs> no, not in modern times, it's not that hidden, it's pretty out there. Oh, that's anyway, true. So this is the period of festivals for, for many cultures, too. Kind of interesting. And well, it's like a harvest. It's a harvest culture uh, thing, isn't yeah, it? Harvest yeah, harvest culture. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. you mentioned you went to Sopot as well. Yes, sir. Uh, after going to this beautiful cathedral uh, and uh, uh, the, the palace there, which is the Museum of Contemporary Art now, also worth seeing. I mean, yeah, it's just great. You easily spend a few hours walking around there. Beautiful park. We'll just finished with that. Both the English-style park and the French style park by the palace. Lovely. 
So, and very, uh, on this particular day, it was very photogenic. It was just a fantastic day. So it was a lot of fun. Um, and then we went over to uh, Sopot. Um, now, <laughs> uh, they have a church in Sopot at the top of a road called Monte Cassino, the Church of St. George, right? Mm. It's a Lutheran church. It was a German church, evangelical, as the Poles call it. Uh, and uh, all Catholic countries think of this as an evangelical, right? Protestant. So evangelical is a nice name for Protestant, I think. Sounds more, uh, yeah, more proper, actually, in many ways. And, and uh, uh, more fitting in some ways because it is more evangelical than the Catholic Church, which has its you know, institutional approach. Um, at any rate, uh, that church was consecrated by Kaiser Wilhelm, or Wilhelm. He consecrated it, or not consecrated, but dedicated it. Appeared at the opening ceremony in 1900. 1900. The street is called because, Monte Cassino. Because Sopot was, was a nice German spy in old, old good olden times. That's right. For, I don't know, a couple hundred years, something like that, almost. Oh, yeah. well, it was for, for at least a hundred years before that, before that church was consecrated. That was a German spa, and right beyond Sopot starts the land of Gdynia, which was the Polish answer to the, to the three city, which was then the free, uh, free city of Gdańsk. Yes, Danzig, yeah. Uh, yeah. As, as the Germans called it, and a lot of people will know it as, as, a lot of people will know it as Danzig. At any rate, uh, there was, but, but to me it was ironic. It was dedicated, the church was dedicated by Kaiser Wilhelm, and he was always running about through Prussia, dedicating bridges and, uh, and canals and factories and you name it, right? Uh, so, but at any rate, and this was close to his, uh, his other residence, which is near Frambourg. Um, you can visit it today, it's be still being restored. And, at any rate, uh, but ironic that it's there on Monte Cassino. And of course, this is the site of the great uh, Allied victory, uh, uh, famously accomplished also by, by the uh, Anders Army in World War II, with the help of Wojtek the Bear. <laughs> and there's a monument to Wojtek the Bear, the beer-drinking bear, who rose to the rank of corporal and participated in the siege of the monastery at Monte Cassino. I love this story and how sweet and human to, to put a statue of the bear there and to remember uh, in, in the seriousness of, of this particular subject, uh, the contribution of this uh, fine uh, uh, Ursus, yeah? Amazing, those this are, fine those bear. Are really interesting stories again, but yeah. Wojtek connects the army to, to the Persia they went through because that's an old Persian bear. Actually. Yes, that's right. He was a, from Iran, Persia, yeah. and they picked him up as they retreated from Russia, the Andrews Army, down into the Middle East, eventually to North Africa, where they joined the Allies, and then went over to on the invasion of of, uh, of Italy through Sicily. Fascinating yeah, stuff. Interesting, interesting stories. We've got to end. Also, Sopot has the largest wooden pier in Europe, and of course, no trip there is is complete without strolling from the church, St. George's, pass and tip your hat to Wojtek the Bear's statue in the churchyard and walk to the bottom of the street and, and, and uh, have a stroll and a sit down. And even you can eat at a restaurant on the longest wooden pier in Europe. And we got to go and now. As the New, Last word. New Zealanders would say, and drink a bear like a bear. <laughs> there you go. What can I say? I can't follow that. Thank you for watching, everyone. That was Ogird Ujiembo. He'll be giving a lecture tomorrow at the University of Knowledge, also known as the University of Warsaw, in, uh, in beautiful downtown Warsaw at 4 p.m. Uh, on Sunday. You'll be seeing this on Saturday night. So if you're in Warsaw, you can go and meet him, and he'll sign autographs for you. You can hear his brilliant lecture on linguistics tomorrow. I'll be there. And if you do show up, come up and say hello. So thanks for watching and good night.